Yeah, that's it. Okay. Okay, I think it's a good time to get started. Um, hi everyone to this PyData Cambridge, our 32nd meetup in June 2021. And of course we are still online. Uh, uh, and, I, and first of all, I invite everyone in the, in, the, in the webinar to please introduce yourself in the chat if you feel comfortable. Just tell us uh, where you're based, where you work. Uh, it's really interesting to see and connect with other people. Uh, and we, we're doing this online now. We used to do it in person. So it's nice to, uh, to, to kind of chat and, uh, and see where people are coming for a meetup. Great, so the agenda for today is this introduction talk as, as, as I'm going through it. We'll have our, our big talk, which is the spotlight on MLOps uh, by Sam Richardson. We'll have a, a small break and then we'll have the lightning talks from, uh, from Chacho, from uh, Kate Taylor and, and Ole. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up. As a note, and it's already recording, this, this meetup is, is being recorded and we'll post it on YouTube afterwards. Uh, so who, who, who we are is essentially we're the local meetup chapter for Cambridge UK. Uh, we, we, we started in November 2008, and we, we had monthly meetups every Wednesday of the last month, and we used to have them at uh, the Raspberry Pi headquarters. Um, and this is organized by, by me, uh, uh, Joris, Leandro, and Ole. And just as a note that we are, oh, that we are all volunteers, so this is what we do in our spare time, and, and we, we like a kind of like to promote this community. Um, so just a bit more information about what PyData. PyData is essentially an educational program of Noom Focus, which, is a, which promotes open code because that means better science. Noom Focus is essentially one of our sponsors because they help us with the meetup setup with the Zoom account. So essentially they're financially helping uh, this, this meetup. And, and as you may know, Noon Focus support, supports a lot of uh, open source projects in the scientific data stack. So a lot of the, a, a lot of the uh, libraries that you may use like Pandas, NumPy, uh, and it's a really, really important place. I do ask you to donate, uh, since they are a charity, you, I do ask you to donate to them if you, if you use those libraries. It'll, it helps, it helps support meetups like the one we have here. Uh, we do have a code of conduct, uh, and this, and essentially, the the gist of it is that you, you this this is in a professional environment, so you have to behave professionally. Uh, we do have also a co code of conduct response team for any any code of conduct issues that you would like to report. So that's all the organizers that I stated before, and someone independent to the organizers, which is Leone. Uh, who is a, a, is independent, and you can if you don't feel comfortable approaching the organizers. Uh, okay. We also have to thank our sponsors, uh, which is ARM, uh, Fetch AI, uh, the Raspberry Pi, and as I mentioned before, Noom Focus. This, they essentially help us uh, organize this. When, when we used to be in person, they would help us with pizza, drinks, and for, for some of the speakers to travel. In this case, uh, they're helping us with the meetup meet up fees and Zoom licenses. So, so please, uh, please, if you do contact any of these um, sponsors, please let them know that that uh, you found about them about them in Pi Data Cambridge. Uh, so, from a Raspberry Pi, they're still, I, I believe, they're still doing their, their weekly live streams. So, so, you can check out their website about what you can do about making making stuff at home. So, please do contact them or go to their website. Uh, Fetch AI is also uh, supporting us and you can see a lot of the interesting things that Fetch AI is working on. Uh, and also more importantly, if you're interested in joining them, uh, they have a lot of positions open uh, at the moment. So please do contact them and mention us if you, if you found it interesting. Uh, if you want to help us, you know, support us so, so that we can keep our sponsors. 
And for ARM, although we don't have any specific positions relevant for PyData Cambridge that I know of, I'm, I work at ARM, uh, please do visit our careers website. There are a lot of positions open. Uh, so in a lot of different locations, actually, since a lot of people in YouTube might be watching us from all over the world. So please do check out if there's anything interesting for you. So finally, uh, how to contact us. We're always looking for speakers. We're also looking, always looking for sponsors and we can, we can see what level of sponsorship we, 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 can, we, can, uh, we can have uh, at the moment. Uh, and also that our recordings are all in the uh, Pi Data TV YouTube. And, it's, and you can contact us on Twitter or on our email, pydatacambridge at gmail.com. Uh, and that's it. So if you do want to speak or you're interested in, in what we're doing, please do email us and contact us. Okay, so that's it. Uh, so we'll start with our first speaker, which is Sam, and I'll let him share his screen. Uh, stop sharing. All right. Sorry, one sec. I think that should be fine. Right. No problem. I share again. <laughs> okay. Great. Is that sharing uh, now? Can you see it should be sort of on a PowerPoint? Uh, yes, it is sharing. One last thing I wanted to say we do have a QA button. So please do use it to add your questions, and, I, and we'll, I'll ask them um, at the end of, this, of the talk. Uh, so please do use the Q&A uh, box there. Yeah, so up, on to you, Sam. Great, thanks. Uh, hi, so hi everyone, I'm Sam Richardson and today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, machine learning operations or ML ops. So this is a quick rundown of the talk. So first I'll talk about why ML ops is important and what it is. And next I'll cover the two main areas uh, which are model training and model serving and finally leave with a few short conclusions. So again, my name is Sam Richardson. I work as a data scientist at GFT. I'm based in the Cambridge AI lab and we work in, uh, from, we're based in the WeWork in Cambridge. Um, so this has been a recently created team to develop new propositions, thought leadership and undertake data science consulting projects for industry. We work with a wide range of different industries. So automobile manufacturing and insurance, some of the ones we worked with. And prior to this, I worked as a startup in aviation field and my background's in material science. Uh, so I said I work in GFT's Cambridge team and we have focus on data science and machine learning. And this is a quick overview of different team members. We work very closely with a lot of collaboration and all the team members have contributed to the work I'll discuss today. So as I said, MLOps is short for machine learning operations and it's the practice of using tools, infrastructure, and workflows to productionize machine learning systems. So why is this important? I'll start with a, a personal story about when I first came into contact with putting ML systems into production. So at my previous job, I worked as a data scientist at this startup, and we participated in this four-week accelerator program. So this was with a big industrial partner, and it went really well. Um, so they provided some data from the systems, we cleaned it up, produced some models, and they had really good performance. So everyone was happy with this. It was uh, sort of a nice result. Um, and this was great until they asked us to run a live trial on real data for six months. Um, so this was a challenge as the system we had was sort of based on sort of several Jupyter notebooks. And it really wasn't set up to run in this way. Uh, so we had a lot of work following this to get the system running into a framework where we could ingest regular batches of data. So there were four key benefits really for implementing good ML ops practice that would have really helped a lot after this accelerator program. So the first major advantage you get is uh, with improving your ability to collaborate with others. So if you have a shared experiment framework, it means you're sort of aligned on methodology and allows for much simpler collaboration. Reproducibility of your work is the second one. So this is incredibly important for any type of science as you, you can't really build upon and develop what you're doing without it. So the third is around scale. So having good infrastructure and practices is, becomes really important as the scale becomes larger. So things that could be, say, a quick manual fix or 
um, sort of a simple job at small scales become impossible to deal with as the data becomes larger and the ingest velocity increases. And then the final point is around security. So by having these practices in place, you get oversight and governance of your data and models. And this is sort of crucial for securing the system and making sure, say, sensitive data isn't seen by the wrong person. Um, so this is really important for a lot of systems. Uh, so MLOps is infrastructure tools and workflows for production ML. Um, this diagram details sort of a typical, say, machine learning system um, in very basic terms. So say from right to left, data is collected, prepared, a machine learning model is trained, and then the model will be deployed to production and evaluated as predictions are made. And we'd group this process into two main components when designing the infrastructure. So there'd be model training and then model serving. And then the, the complication of managing these components is that the output of a machine learning system is a function of the data ingested at the start, as well as the code. So you can control the code that you write and that can be controlled for, um, but you can't control, say, the data coming into a live system so easily. Um, so you get sort of extra complications and you need sort of extra logging and tracking. Um, so here's um, sort of an example infrastructure um, that we would have set up. So we use Google Cloud a lot. This is an example, say, set of tools for Google Cloud. Um, and the infrastructure requirements for implementing, say, a proper framework can be complex. Um, so say this our infrastructure has different components, say for user interface, model serving, model training, and then security and operations. So there's kind of two things we use to kind of help us with dealing with a lot of this infrastructure. So the first is we make use of a lot of managed cloud services, which reduces the maintenance burden for us and any clients we work with. And there are a huge amount of different managed cloud services from these different cloud vendors that can sort of reduce IT management needs. And then the second one is around infrastructure as code. So this allows us to say manage the setup and tear down of all these components in a reliable fashion. Um, and we use an open source tool for this called Terraform. Um, so this really, you represent all of your infrastructure as code and you can say version it. It would allow a small team to kind of quickly set up and maintain complex and powerful infrastructure. Um, the kind of thing you'd need for supporting a production machine learning system. Um, so that's kind of the overview of what it is and sort of why it's important. Um, so now I'll talk a bit about the model training part of the piece. So model training is generally performed in a data pipeline. So this could be batch or streaming data. For, and then for model training, the key elements to look for are, say, the pipelines themselves, um, data testing, and then sort of tracking of metadata and artifacts that are produced from the, the pipeline. So a good pipeline framework will allow a team to say manage and schedule the work to be performed. So here you can see we start with uh, raw data, um, prepare the data, test the data. We end up with model ready data, so uh, sort of cleaned up. Then we can fit a model and we would output say a trained model object. So at each stage of the process, um, there's a huge amount of this metadata to capture um for in terms of reproducibility and governance so i've given some details of sort of some of the pieces of information you might be looking to um keep at each stage and what we typically do is have say structured data in a metadata store and then unstructured things like a model object could go in a um, artifact store so for each of these sort of key elements i'll go through a bit more detail and provide some examples of the tools uh, we typically use in the team so uh, pipeline frameworks are sort of really nice for managing uh, data pipelines. Typically, the frameworks are based on DAGs, which is a directed acyclic graph. So this means uh, the work performed is directed in that it goes from A to B, and it does not cycle. So this is an example picture of a DAG. You can see it goes from run this first to join. Uh, from A to B, it doesn't cycle. But within these two constraints, you can have, say, a lot of different complex logic. So here you're getting, say, a lot of different branching going on. Um, Airflow is a popular option. It's one we use sort of commonly within our team. Um, so it has a lot of really great features, including sort of nice UI for managing pipelines and jobs. 
um, and a scheduler for triggering jobs and can do things like send you email alerts if there are any issues. Um, and because it's sort of one of the most commonly used tools, it has a really large community, good com documentation and a wide range of different integrations. And then also quite importantly, uh, sort of for our team, it has a lot of managed service implementation, so on all major cloud platforms. So this sort of simplifies setup and management if you're um, trying to set up something and you don't have a huge, a, a large team to say maintain it. So in terms of pipeline frameworks, recently there's been a huge amount of development in these tools um, over the last few years, and they all sort of approach the challenge slightly differently. Um, so two ones I think are very interesting is Kedro is a particularly nice tool. Um, so this can be used in conjunction with Airflow um, and is used specifically around sort of authoring the actual pipeline work itself. Um, and it kind of allows you to maintain really nice development standards when you're sort of creating a data science workflow. Um, and Kubeflow is very nice as well if you're sort of running on Kubernetes. So next I'll talk about data testing. Um, and as I said sort of before, the output of a machine learning system is a function of the code that describes the pipeline um, and sort of more importantly is uh, in terms of is the data that goes in. So that's the part that um, does, can vary a lot. So the code you can test regularly with uh, unit tests and system tests, but it's also very important to perform data tests as well as new data comes into the systems. So uh, one of the big assumptions you have when you train a machine learning model is that the sample of training data you train the model on is representative of this wider population that will come through the data during production. So it's important to make sure that as new data comes in, it matches the expectations you have about the data. Because out of distribution data can sort of quite quickly turn the best models into random number generators. Um, so this is a fun example from that was published by OpenAI. Um, so this is a model say that they've trained to recognize visual features, but also text as well. Um, so say it works well in the first picture of the apple, but if you had pictures of fruit with labels on them, um, it would get quickly confused. So say putting a piece of paper with iPod on it now makes it classify as an iPod. Um, so this kind of shows it's important to understand what data is coming into your system and you want to aim for the data that's fed into the model during production matches the assumptions you make during training. Uh, so generally, the best idea is to say when you set up your system, you can explicitly write your assumptions about the data um, and use these as tests during the pipeline runs. Um, so this is kind of the, the method that's used by great expectations. So this is an open source tool that we use a lot. Um, so you can use this tool to test data against a list of expectations and output the results as um, structured JSON files if you want to do sort of mach machine automation or human interpretable HTML reports. And then finally, in terms of model training, to make the work undertaken by the pipeline accountable and reproducible, it's important to have proper logging. And the aim is to create in the aim, sorry, for creating a reproducible pipeline is to record enough information so you could trace a pipeline run back to um, the input or sort of set of environments that you set it off with. Or if you have a result, you can then produce that identical result again. Um, and so pipelines output structured and unstructured data will really be tracked. Um, we typically use a metadata store for structured and an artifact store for unstructured data. So MLflow is an open source tool which can be used for managing both of these repositories. Um, it has a really nice UI that allows you to explore the track data and a really flexible tracking API that's quite simple to just add into your code and start adding tracking hooks throughout um, the work you're writing. The other nice thing about it is it's very modular and you can use different storage backends for the metadata and the artifacts. So we work a lot in Google Cloud um, and you can use say a managed SQL instance um, for your structured data and then um, Google Cloud storage for your object data. Um, but there's sort of tie-ins with say S3 for AWS or the Azure Blob store if you're in um, Azure. So now I'll do a quick demo of some of these components just kind of give you an idea of how they look. Um, so this will be a quick show of different components running on Google Cloud Platform. Um, and I'll show Airflow with some data pipelines, some metadata and artifacts in MLflow, 
and data testing with great expectations. Uh, right, so I'll switch over my screen now. So hopefully everyone should be able to see a web browser. Um, so this is the Airflow interface. Um, on the interface, this is kind of the main panel you get. You get sort of your lists of different jobs. Um, so these are all different DAGs that describe sort of the, the tasks. Um, you get some management info in terms of owner, um, how many runs have been successful or failed recently, information about the schedule um, around the last run and sort of recent tasks. Um, and then say you can go on a particular task. So this is kind of a sort of uh, developed system we have running. Um, so this is one task for doing say an ETL job. Um, and within that DAG, you're getting say different views. Ah, let's see. Oops. Right, let's just go to the different one. So within the task, you get different views and you can kind of track um, where the tasks are. I think I might have lost connection to my VM during the talk start. Um, and you can also do things like um, look at, say, the code that's produced um, and set up different admin controls, et cetera. So next, I'll go on ML Flow. Uh, so this is what we use for, say, tracking different pipeline information and tracking our experimental runs. Um, so here, everything's split into experiments. Um, so often we use, say, like a different experiment for, say, a different model training, and also often keep an experiment running to track, say, ETL processes as well. So you can see what, say, version of the data is running in or when the date you've sort of ingested your different data streams. Um, so you get sort of all your different runs. Um, you can look at different model packages that have been used different parameters you've logged, different metrics you've recorded. Um, so say if you go on a particular model run, this is one model being trained. You can see all different parameters, metrics, and then you also get unstructured objects attached to this run as well. So you get information about the model, the model object itself. It also has uh, a model repository. Let's reconnect. So any problem with doing live? <laughs> so it also does have a model repository. Um, so this would allow you to look at different versions of the models um, and you can tie back. And the thing that's really nice that I was gonna show now was um, you can go for say a particular model and trace it back to the original source run that it came from. So this is where you start to tie the picture together and go from the, the models in your repository that are ready to put in production and train them back to that original run where they came from. Um, and last, I'll just go on great expectations. So um, this is the tool we use for data testing. Um, and it has kind of two sort of main modes. The first thing you can do is look at profiling your data sets. So you might do this when a new data set comes in. Um, this is very similar to pandas profiling, if anyone's used that. Um, and you get kind of an overview of some of your data in terms of the main uh, data set and then the different parameters, distribution sort of, et cetera. Um, so then when you've got your data and you understand what's going on, and you've sort of created expectations around what you expect, you can write these explicitly as a set of expectations. So this is just a set of tests and they, they represent this as a JSON file, um, but they have sort of a couple different APIs for authoring these if you don't want to write it sort of as a raw JSON. Um, and when you're set up and running, you can do regular tests. So these are say regular tests going into our storage system. Um, and then you get reports out as your data test is performed. So this can output say as a, a JSON if you want to automate the next stage of your pipeline, or if you want a human in the loop type system, you can output these as HTML reports and see whether your tests are successfully being completed. So this is say a very simple kind of example type test. I have six expectations on my data. You can see that say this field is required, it's not null, and the values are um, belonging to the set I expect. Um, but it's this kind of thing you can set up and sort of build up your expectations and then avoid, say, issues of, say, strange data being pulled into your system. Um, right, so that's kind of everything I want to talk about in terms of a, a quick overview of different tools used for um, model training. So now we have, say, our machine trained machine learning model, and we're ready to deploy the model to production. 
Um, so the best approach here is to deploy the model as an API. So this is decoupled from the application logic. Um, and this simplifies the development and allow those developing the model to work independently of the application code. So data can be processed by the model online, say for an asynchronous, uh, synchronous low latency response or offline for an asynchronous batch prediction. Um, and the general flow you kind of have would be your model is taken from your model repository, um, it's set up in your service, and then application client can request predictions, um, and then the model can supply the predictions and then push the uh, logging information to some sort of uh, model logs. Um, so in terms of infrastructure, as before, we try to use managed services for these whenever we can. Um, and for serving, th this gives a lot of um, advantages. So this is things like auto scaling, authentication, and sort of simple management tools. So generally the deployment tools are around deploying a Docker container or deploying a model object itself. Um, and generally we found that container deployment has been more flexible for our needs. So um, there's often restrictions in what model libraries you can use with the model deployment options. Um, and it's sometimes trickier to sort of hook on different elements. Um, so there are sort of options for container or model deployment on sort of all the major clouds. So GCP has AI platform or Vertex AI for doing managed model deployment and then cloud run for doing managed container deployment. Um, and this is kind of an example workflow in GCP. So you would have the model deployed. So it's taken from MLflow. Um, you'd have the, the image built in cloud build, which is a CI CD tool for just building Docker images. You can store that image in a repository and then um, deploy it as your model service. So this would run as a managed service in cloud run um, and results could be requested from the user as through this REST API. And then any logging information as the models run can be pushed to cloud logging um, so you can track what's going on. And then also we often hook it up to an in-memory memory base like uh, Redis. So this is a managed version of Redis. Um, if we have, say, additional information that's added in during training. So things like, say, if there was weather information. And this would allow us just to sort of independently hydrate this service without having to redeploy the whole model. Um, so I'll try and do a quick demo, hopefully. <laughs> Let's see if the, uh, it's still running when we try and get onto it. Um, so in this one, we're gonna be looking at some model training serving components. Um, so this will be compute running in Google Cloud Run, and then logging running in Google Cloud Logging. And then I'm, I've used a sync to push that information to Google BigQuery sort of for easier analysis and uh, visualization. Right, so we should be back on the web browser. So this is on Google Cloud Platform. Uh, so this is the Cloud Run interface. Um, and you get, on the first instance, you get kind of a list of your different services. Um, so these are all different APIs that are running. Uh, and the tick means that it is sort of up and running, ready to go. You get information about how many requests you're getting recently, um, what region they're running in, um, sort of et cetera, and then say who deployed them, when they were deployed. Um, you can look at a, say, particular service. So this is one of our APIs we set up. Um, you get different metrics. So this is kind of some of the management tools I was talking about. You can see, say, how many request counts. You get information about billable times. You can understand the cost you're running. Um, at the moment, this is a slightly older API. So um, there isn't any data, but it just sort of populate all these fields automatically. Um, you can start doing different revisions and do kind of continuous deployment type uh, running. And then you also get different logs as well. Um, and you can choose to sort of which information from that API call um, you want to run out as a log. Uh, and then what I've done here is because we were using this information to populate a dashboard, I've put the information to Google BigQuery. So this is just um, Google's sort of data warehouse solution. Uh, and you can see the data set here. So um, this is the logging information. You can see things like what project it's from, what's my service name, and then you get sort of some of the more information, interesting information. So you get 
the model version. So this corresponds to a model version in our model repository that's managed by MLflow. Um, you get, say, the model name, you get the response that the model gave on this particular instance, you get the information provided by the, the user who called the API. Um, so this is where you can kind of see you're getting that joined up picture where you could go, here is my model, it is this model version, I can track it back to my repository, and then from my repository I can see the source run that, uh, that the model was trained from, and you see exactly what the environment that the model was trained from. Um, so this is kind of how you get to the point where you can, if you were to get to it, the, the point where someone comes to you and says that there's an issue and the model is giving strange results, um, it's caused this sort of strange action, you could go look at your log, see what the result was, and track it back to sort of the original source of uh, how the model was trained and what went into the model in the first place. Uh, so this kind of gives you the sort of full governance picture um, in terms of your pipeline. Uh, right, so that's kind of everything in terms of model serving and that sort of completes my very quick overview of uh, these different system components. Uh, so in conclusions, um, I'd say hopefully this talk has shown that MLOps is kind of really key to putting machine learning into production um, and really it gives you sort of aid with collaboration, reproducibility and working at scale and security. Um, the next thing is to keep in mind is that the machine learning system is a function of the data and the code. Um, so that's where a lot of the challenges come from, but also makes it very interesting. Um, so really for this, because it's um, sort of these complications, it's automated logging and testing are, are really key for all of these components. And that's where a lot of this lies, is just making sure everything is recorded and kind of your framework is kind of as reproducible as possible. Um, and with that, I'll say thanks very much. So thanks to my team who've uh, worked with me on this result and thanks for listening, everyone. Um, so I've got some contact details here if anyone uh, would like to get in touch. Uh, so we post a lot on our LinkedIn group um, and, and through our Medium channel as well. So we have podcasts and we also have a lot of blogs coming out on some uh, insurance work at the moment. I think there's a natural language uh, model deployment blog coming out as well soon. Uh, so yeah, thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Sam. Uh, please do ask, put any questions in the Q&A, but I'll get us started. So you didn't kind of mention it. Uh, I did kind of mention it before. You did kind of mention it before uh, that you went from an experience where you were working, you know, Jupyter Notebook code and you were trying to essentially deploy it. So was there any issues with um, convincing people and kind of like stop using notebooks or, or at least you can do initial work in the notebooks, but moving towards, uh, you know, the, you know, it is quite a lot of stuff to, to learn, right? Lots of tools. Do you feel like there was some, some kind of uh, pushback to, to moving to, to this ML ops of working? Um. So I suppose, yeah, I'm, I, yeah, I guess I'd say, first of all, that, yeah, we do use a lot of the notebooks still, and it is kind of really sort of perfect for kind of experimentation type work and figuring out how these ideas are going to work in the first instance. Um, I suppose in this case, it sort of became quite obvious. There, there was, there was sort of three of us working on this team, um, and it became quite obvious that we really had to do something kind of different because um, the, it was just very messy. We'd worked so sort of hard and fast to get it, everything working um, that it, it was sort of, well, this is going to be very messy to deal with. Even running it once more with the identical data, it's sort of keep your fingers crossed. Hopefully this will work. Um, so we kind of all, in the instance of working through that problem, I guess we all sort of convinced ourselves um, that that would be the issue. Um, and then I guess since then, um, because now at the moment, the, I guess the way GFT works um, is that we're sort of producing sort of prototypes of a new sort of um, technology, but at the same time making it production ready so it could be deployed. So um, with that kind of setup, we really have to have all this instrumentation in place. Otherwise, uh, sort of the results the other way are sort of potentially sort of more worrying that I guess you start to get a bit nervous that things might not work if they're not really sort of tied up and sort of sorted out properly. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but it is interesting that it, 
it is kind of like an adoption. Uh, it is a, a change of way of, of the way of doing things a bit. Mm. And, and I think it's, um, it's important for people to change, but it is, it is tough sometimes to convince people that this yes, is worth yeah. investing, investing into. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. We had a lot of problem or not say we had a lot of, um, say discussions around say these particular set of technologies we've decided on so um that was a lot of the work we were doing say um setting up the group at the beginning just deciding on say uh, going through a lot of these different tools and picking which ones made sense for us to use so um because as i said say in terms of collaboration you all want to be on the same page on the same platform so um you kind of all have to go through and have a discussion and find out sort of what are the pros and cons for these different technologies and what would fit for our particular group so we can all kind of use be aligned on everything sort of moving forwards um i've been told there might be an issue with the q a box if you can't write your question in the q a box please just put it in the chat uh, so ngs asks at the last meeting we heard about feature stores do you think feature stores are mature enough for ml ops to use in production uh, so I think I haven't used so much feature stores. I know there are, say, a lot of feature stores in um, some of these production tools. So the new version of uh, the kind of AI tools on GCP has a feature store built in, so it has a Vertex AI. Um, a lot of the work we've been doing, I guess we're setting up a new project on new data sets. So we haven't used so much of a persistent feature store because we're often getting set up on a new data set, sort of looking into the hypothesis and then moving to a different data set. Um, but it, it does look like there are sort of more feature store type tools in place, but it, it's one that I haven't used too much myself. Great. Um, we have another question in the chat. Do you have a recommendation for industries that cannot use cloud platforms like Google? But but need to run their workflows on premise, for instance, for regulatory or privacy reasons. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of these tools are open source. So we use a lot of these managed services uh, because it reduces the sort of the, the management for us. But most of these services are based on open source tools. So Airflow is um, an Apache project. MLflow is an open source Databricks project. And Great Expectations, again, is open source. Um, so a lot of these kind of different tools and practices are all available open source. It would just be, you would have to sort of do more of the maintenance yourself. Uh, we have another question in the QA. How long did it take you to move from a Jupyter notebook only environment to the proper uh, ML ops? Um, so I, I guess it's quite a lot of, potentially it can be quite a lot of work in the first instance. We've kind of layered our approach, say, as we've built up. So um first of all we started just looking at pipeline tools and we built tools with airflow um and then we added on ml flow and then we added on great expectations um and we were using say every time we add on a layer we tend to try and automate the process so you can kind of build up your capabilities as you go um and this would allow you say you can start a new project and then start up your system and you work from say um the point you got to before it's kind of the same for the infrastructure code thing as well so our infrastructure can get slightly more complicated and we just build up our capability at sort of uh, deploying this code cool. all right thank you very much i think that's it for the questions so i would just like to say thank you again sam for for this great talk um and uh, and we'll just have a two minute break and then we'll get started with the lightning talks. Um, yes. Chacho, Chacho, if you can share your screen, we can get started then. All right. Um, just to say for the lightning talks, we can also have a, a few questions, but since the talks are five minutes, it should be something like a minute or two of questions if anyone has any. So I'll, I'll wait until people write something up in the Q&A. Right, let's just take a small break and then we'll come back at uh, 45.
All right, so uh, let's let's get started with our first lightning talk from Axel Fuentes on how to ask for help. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Axel Fuentes. Some people know me as Chacho. Um, today, I'm going to talk about how to ask for help. Well, this is me. When I started to call until now, sometimes, uh, and probably it might be a frustrating task, especially at the beginning. A new environment, new syntax, another language, new packages, looks overwhelming, I think. So many times we don't get the expected output when we run a script, and that worried us, right? And that's my story. If if you have had this mode once, please send me through the chat. Um, yeah, and what happened when, when we have a programming problem? Sadly, we ask for help. So might be the expectation. Uh, we have to read the documentation, but in reality, the first thing we do is go to some online community. Another common aspect is, is an expectation where we have to review similar questions before posted one. But the reality is that we post your, your, your own question immediately. Then I'm not trying to say that as for help, it's bad, not at all. As for help, it's not the problem. But maybe you are trying to have a quick answer. But even if you get it, probably you are not going to understand it. Then you are going to copy and paste. The main problem here is you don't understand what is your problem. So now you have two problems. Yeah, um, and the fact here is that you are to an online community without weapons. So I recommend you to try to understand first your problem until go to an online community. Go line by line through your script, see what every single line does, what the function does, what the package does. And for sure, you learn a lot during, during this process and this is very valuable. Try and try and try. Or as the image say, just do it. And if you do not get it, then go for help. If you want to level up your coding skills, you will have to read code and documentation. So the moral here is please don't go to the war without weapons for sure. Here are some tips in order to understand your doubts. First, name your question. That have to resume your problem in one sentence. Second, give a fairly background, explains what are your goals or the problem that you are trying to solve, and also the tools that you are using. Second, uh, the third, and, and I think this is the most crucial step, you have to be, you show a piece of your code when you think the problem is not all your code. If you did the above steps right, the community can know what is at the top and at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I mean, show that you are not looking for someone to solve your entire problem. And finally, describe um, that piece of code what is your expected output, your actual output, or if exists, what is the error? Yeah, um, community will give you the right answer if and only if you provide them the right piece of the puzzle. Understand your problem, it's important to communicate your problem accurately. Remember, every mind is a war in in the college, a professor said to my class, learn to define your system. And 
uh, someone sometimes said to me, don't put yourself straight to do something because if you are pushing yourself, you are don't enjoy it. And if you are don't enjoy it, you are not learning. There is no rush. All place is here. All moment is now. Then be kind with yourself. So happy coding, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chacho, uh, Axel. Uh, cool. Uh, any questions really quickly? Uh, you can put in the Q&A or in the chat. So I'll leave it for a few seconds. I think we might be okay. Kate, if you can share your screen so we can do the next lightning talk, please. I hope you can see it now. Um, we cannot see it at the moment. Okay, I'll share again. Yes, we can. Uh, I think we might be seeing the second um, second slide. Yeah, Lovely. perfect. Thank you so much. All right, so let's get started. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kate Taylor. I normally work on the Science Park at Lingomatics, where we're a data mining company. Today, I want to talk to you about Python and the semantic web. Uh, anyone with a smart device has probably come across problems like this. Uh, you ask your smart device to turn on the living room lights and you get told there's no pudding room. I mean, to me personally, I, I think I'd be disappointed by the lack of a pudding room too. But um, joking apart, is there some way that we could make these smart devices understand a little bit more about what's going on? And linked to that, I mean, when we're looking at text, can we find a way of disambiguating and working out what's actually happening? The semantic web's been around for a while. It was, um, the term was coined by Tim Berners-Lee um, way back when, uh, to the idea of encoding data so that it could be processed by machines. And so we've had a go encoding in XML and a lot of financial and medical data is encoded that way. Um, we all use JSON. RDF is another way of, of trying to um, embed um, knowledge together and build relationships. OWL is used for ontologies. There's quite a few formats out there. I worked um, in the University of Cambridge Computer Laboratory funded by MIT um, in the mid 2000s. Um, we were writing a help to compile a help system for Verilog uh, using Prolog um, because there was no Python yet. But um, the idea was that we would try to find relevant parts of the manual or Wikipedia to display. Uh, and that we would mine out to MIT's new concept net uh, to see if we could help with um, misunderstandings. So we were building some kind of use the model to see how the, uh, the person was learning this new language. If you're interested in that, you can read our publications at the link below. Concept net is a, um, as it suggests by the name, a network. So um, concepts are in the nodes and relationships are in the graphs. So uh, it understands things like isa has, part of, is used for, made of, similar, um, and that is enough to, um, and has a, which is enough to make up quite a, um, a powerful network. At the time I was using it um, with Prolog, it was not particularly large, um, so we couldn't make too much use of it, and especially it wasn't particularly strong in the area of um, big science because it was done by crowdsourcing, um, which meant not many people were that much interested uh, a lot of uh, information was coming on about real life things, which again is brilliant. But now um, data's come on board in the last few years from Games with a Purpose and other linked data that we've come, come in from OWL and RDF sources as well. So today is a different matter. And of course today we've got other options um, to talk to the uh, concept net. So um, I decided to explore it again using Python. And I used the examples um, in the bottom link uh, on the left hand side. So what I was really interested in is the concept of relatedness of two concepts. So here um, I've used the request library. Um, I'm using the uh, Python console and I'm asking how related is a mug and a cup? So um, both of them are uh, suitable for putting hot drinks in. Um, and because they share a common parent, then we get a relatedness um, of five, uh, 0.541. So this is a measure of how close they are on the graph. Um, and if I was to put in uh, mug and mug, I would get a value of one. 
So, okay, um, let's go back to this, this poor smart device. Um, could we have used this kind of um, network to help with that? So I've put in living room and pudding, and I get back a value of 0 0.031. They're not related at all, um, if, if so, very distantly, um, probably because they're both inanimate objects. Now, um, obviously, um, a smart device has also got to deal with speech recognition. But once the recognizing has been done and the information is in textual form, then yes, you could, in theory, try and plug in this kind of thing, a disambiguation for a, a smart device or for a piece of text. Whilst I was here, I thought I would see if puddings um, are related to happiness. Um, in my book, they frequently are. Um, according to ConceptNet, less so. But hey, um, computers don't know everything, do they? As I said, I work for Linguomatics. We're rapidly expanding, um, obviously with the COVID um, epidemic and, and all the uh, existing medical work we do, um, we really do need um, some more people. Um, a lot of our data is in unstructured text, so we're looking at these kind of concepts. We're looking at machine learning to do feature detection. Um, we take our output from our um, documents and database analysis and put them into machine learning. Um, we do a lot of disambiguation and sentiment analysis, spelling corrections, OCR. If any of this is of tall interest to you, then please do get in touch with us at the um, URL at the bottom of the page, um, and we'd be pleased to hear from you. Thank you very much. Any questions would be welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Kate. Any questions for Kate, please do post them now. Uh, we'll wait a few seconds. Um, I'm also disappointing there, there is no pudding room. <laughs> oh, that sounds great. There is one question. Uh, ConceptNet looks fun. What other API endpoints would you recommend trying out? Uh, I've used WordNet in the past, um, which again is another way of um, helping with disambiguation. Um, I mean, I think there are quite a few ways. The um, I think our um, ontologies, for example, often always uh, offer um, API endpoints, as do um, ontologies written in another format called ANSI, A-N-S-I. So, I mean, there's plenty around, um, but I'd be happy to discuss that further later. Yeah, and I, I, th I, I guess they can come in contact with you. Uh, they can, yes, kate.taylor.lingomatics.com. Uh, Perfect. Um, I, there doesn't seem to be any other questions, so we'll move on to our last lightning talk, which is one of our own, Ole, one of the organizers with his lighting talk. Ole, if you can share your screen, please. Yep, I'm here and I'm just, I just realized I didn't do a trial run of the screen sharing. So probably it's okay. going to fail now. No, it's okay, uh, we can see it. Okay, cool. All right, so for our last lighting talk, let's uh, have Ole. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. So, um, my lightning talk is uh, unusual because um, it uh, has not so much Python, uh, but it has a lot of history in it. And um, uh, I'm going to start with uh, a picture. You, um, many of you will remember at the, the uh, onset of the, the COVID crisis, the NHS uh, founded uh, a lot of um, or several emergency hospitals all over the country. Uh, this here is a picture uh, from Wikipedia of the the uh, 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 the clinic that was set up in in London. And uh, if you look very carefully in the middle, uh, you see that it's called uh, the Nightingale Hospital. So it is named after Florence Nightingale. And um, I was just curious uh, what the story was behind that person. And I, uh, I realized um, the, uh, this person, Florence Nightingale, has a, a very interesting life story and this has uh, interesting uh, takeaway points for data scientists nowadays as well. So uh, Florence Nightingale lived in the uh, 19th century and she was trained as a nurse, but she had also a very keen interest in, in statistics and in, in particular data. So obviously the, the term data scientist uh, didn't exist back then, but uh, uh, the, the application and the analysis of data was very uh, important to her. And um, she, she um, traveled, uh, Florence Nightingale traveled a lot, 
um, and um, one uh, one of her travels coincided with the uh, war in in Crimea, uh, which is again in the news nowadays. Um, and um, in uh, that that was a war of the the Ottoman Empire against the Russian Empire, but the the British troops British troops were also involved. So Florence. Uh, uh, traveled to one of the field hospitals of the British army near uh, Istanbul um, in Turkey. And, um, and the, the conditions were there were horrific, um, had absolutely nothing to do with, with a hospital as we know it nowadays. There was no, no sanitation, no, no uh, sewage, uh, absolutely no basic levels of hygiene, um, no food provisions and, and terrible uh, diseases. Like typhoid, where were ripe, uh, and and the the mortality was was very very high. So uh, Florence uh, Nightingale set out to to improve these these horrible standards and introduced like sewage and and laundry facilities to wash sheets and clothing of the soldiers, and 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 regular uh, food supplies as well. So so lots of things that are just pretty common standard nowadays, but were not back then. And um, so, so this is all good and well, but, but as I said already, Florence Nightingale also had, had really this very, very meticulous attitude to, to data. And she wanted to use uh, data to basically make her point that hygiene and, and food provisions are just important to keep wounded soldiers alive in a hospital. And um, th this is one of the analysis that, uh, you came up, I, I'm sure um, many of you have seen this plot already, but maybe not looked into the details. So, so those are, um, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a time series that you see here. So, so the time runs from the uh, rightmost plot, sort of like in, in counterclockwise direction, you see how these, uh, uh, these sections are labeled with different months. So, we start at the beginning of the war, and, and then the time moves further. And then the, the smaller uh, plot on the left-hand side is the uh, second half of the Crimean War. And um, the, the, these, these sections, these colored sections, in, uh, represent soldiers that died, and the colors represent the death causes. And um, in blue is basically from um, uh, diseases, um, or deaths from of soldiers from diseases, and then uh, red is uh, like wounds, usually wounds, you know, that occurred in in uh, in in battle, and and black are all other types of of uh, death causes uh, lumped together, and you can see the the um, for for the most months, sort of like the first part of the war, the the number of uh, death that occurred from diseases just vastly outnumbered all other causes of death. And then uh, sort of like between March 1855 uh, and, and the next month, things, things start to change. And, um, and, uh, and this is basically where uh, these sanitary changes and hygiene changes that uh, Florence Nightingale uh, introduced in the hospital started to kick in. So, so, so the death rates drop very significantly. So you see the, the zoomed part, uh, how, how the numbers and the relation of the causes of death change. So Florence Nightingale used this plot basically when she was back in London to prove her point to the British government and to introduce these changes. Uh, and and they, they became, uh, far more common uh, in, in the British army and in also other armies and in other hospitals all over the world. And Florence Nightingale became over the years a uh, really highly respected figure for you know, nursing and, and, and standards of hospitalization. And there are nowadays um, memorials and, and, and uh, statues for her um, in many places. This one here is in London to remember the house where she lived. Um, so now you might ask, why is he telling you all of? Uh, why, is, why is he telling us all of this? Uh, I, I think it's a very interesting story because a lot of the problems that Florence Nightingale had uh, might um, sound very familiar to us. And uh, of course, you know, nowadays we have we have cloud computing and we have machine learning, but sort of the underlying problems, you know, existed already back then. In the 19th century, so so um, when Florence Nightingale arrived to this hospital, it was just not known uh, why 
so many people are dying and what the causes are. Nobody was literally counting how many people are dying every month. So she had to start and 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 uh, collect this data, and and it was not clear what the causes uh, of deaths, what the underlying causes of deaths uh, were, were there, and sort of this idea that you could uh, use graphics to tell a story and to convey your opinion and to to shape opinion is. Um, is, was also relatively new and she shaped that. And another uh, uh, funny uh, sort of anecdote from her life was is that uh, she actually shared for some time a flat with uh, her cousin who was a professional graphics designer. And I think a lot of the diagrams and, and plots that Florence Nightingale designed uh, this, this cousin had, had, had an impact as well. So collaborations with other disciplines were already key back then. So I found this this whole life story was really fascinating. There's a lot more details to it that you can read up uh, in these links. Um, there are also people that are trying to reproduce uh, many of uh, Florence Nightingale's plots in Python. There's the last link is about that. And uh, finally, my my uh, last slide of conclusion is, uh, you know, we always look for speakers, as uh, Federico said. Uh, so please step forward, uh, volunteer to give a talk and help us grow the, the data science community in Cambridge. And yeah, you can contact us under this email address. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ole. Uh, I th thank you for your talk. Uh, I think that visualization is quite famous and it's quite important. Um, we, we probably should host a lot more visualization uh, talks. We, we don't actually... I don't recall we have a lot of them. So if you anyone has a visualization talk, please, please contact us. Um, well, that's it. Anyone have any questions for Ole? If not, I think then that's the end of our meetup. And I would like to essentially thank everyone for coming. Um, hopefully soon uh, we can see each other in person in an actual physical meetup. Uh, thank you. I think there's no questions. So thank you everybody. And that's the end. Bye, thanks. Thank you.